For nearly 2,000 years, the world has been turned upside down over what can only be called the most controversial book of all time. To its critics, the Bible is merely a combination of myth and legend mingled with history. But for those who believe in its sacred writings, it is the inspired and an errant word of God. A divine record that not only tells the way by which men get to heaven, but also warns of an eternal judgment for those who reject the light of truth found within. Jesus said, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. After he was crucified and raised from the dead, the followers of Jesus Christ went into all the world. To the Jews first, and then to the Gentiles, they preached that Jesus is the true Messiah, and that he suffered for the sins of men, according to the writings of the Holy Scripture. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. But Jesus himself had said to his disciples, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. The apostles also warned believers about seducing spirits and doctrines of devils and of certain men who would creep into the church with deception and lies. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Through the Middle Ages, many of the reformers came to believe that these warnings pertained to the rise of the Roman Church. In the book of Revelation, they saw the picture of Rome's apostasy presented as an unfaithful woman sitting atop a seven-headed beast. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints 
and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. But the Roman church did not rise up overnight. It came about one step at a time through the early centuries. If you look at your early church history, you had five patriarchates that came into being, Antioch, Jerusalem, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. So you had five main church centers over the first couple of hundred years, but uh, Alexandria fell and Jerusalem and Antioch also uh, fell early on. So you were left with Constantinople and Rome. So you had those two, but Rome gained the ascendancy in the West. They're, they're developed by the fourth, fifth, sixth century controversies among all the bishops in various parts of the world, especially Europe and uh, the Middle East. And whenever there was a controversy, some court had to decide what the answer is. And many uh, problems that arose early on, theological problems would then be sent to Rome to be looked at and answers given. While the New Testament church had begun in ancient Jerusalem and spread throughout the Gentile world, somehow the leadership of Rome dominated as the chief oracle in matters of debate. Well, you gotta remember the history of Rome. Uh, the Roman Empire was a great empire for hundreds of years, and the popes became the heirs to that kind of power. In the fifth century, one of the most well-known doctors of the early church, Augustine of Hippo, would make reference to a conflict that arose between certain African bishops. Augustine wrote, in this matter, Two councils have already sent letters to the Apostolic See, and from thence, rescripts have come back. The cause is finished. What Augustine was saying in that very famous statement, he was saying this, if Rome makes a decision, that settles it. So they needed a court, and the prestige of the empire was in the city of Rome uh, by the, you know, Augustine's uh, time. And so that's all he's saying, he said, when we have an issue, when we have a difference of opinion, let's turn to Rome. In the centuries that followed, Augustine's statement would be paraphrased by the popes and doctors of the Roman church. His words were taken to mean, Rome has spoken, the matter is closed. In other words, if the church of Rome sets forth an opinion, all other churches must obey. Then, in the fifth century, the ancient empire suffered its decline and fell as it was sacked by the barbarian tribes that would reduce the city of seven hills to ruin. Rome was overrun by the Huns and the Attila the Hun, and so the whole system of the empire was defeated, and so the popes then began to take the place of the ancient Caesars, and so they came to take over not only uh, spiritual leadership, but also political leadership. And so Rome from then on uh, grasped that more and more power, and that's how the papacy really came into being. While the papacy did not spring up overnight, and there were many events that led to its development, the date most often looked to by Protestant historians is 606 AD, when the Roman Emperor Phocas named Pope Boniface III the universal bishop over all the Christian churches. This is when the papal power was said to be officially established in Rome. For a man to say that he is the true leader of all Christianity is not only unbiblical, but it goes completely against God's word 
and it opens a door for a control system to be set up that can control the world that Satan can use. And so I would say that this concept of a pope from the beginning was Satan's plan for man to manipulate the church in the name of Christ but set up a system of anti-Christ or anti-Christian belief system. Once the papal system came into being and it was clear that it represented uh, an apostate system that combined pagan teachings and traditions with worldly politics all under the mask of Christianity, you had Christians then that fell into two categories. There were those who followed after the teachings of the Pope and the Church of Rome, and then you had those who were known throughout history as Bible believers, who kept themselves separate from Rome and were determined to base their faith on the scriptures alone without any kind of man-made doctrines or sacred councils which they had in the Roman system. It was because they rejected the Pope's claims of authority that many Bible believers were persecuted in the early centuries. English author Adrian Hilton writes that the Roman pseudo-Christianity caused many faithful believers to flee into the mountains of Europe and Asia Minor to escape persecution and death. And there they continued away from the world's view as the true church of Christ. These groups, in many cases, opposed Rome. They usually looked upon Rome as the Antichrist. They looked upon the mass as blasphemy. Uh, they didn't believe in the priesthood of Rome and uh, many other of the teachings of Rome they repudiated and claimed that they went back to the early church, particularly the Waldensians or the Valenses. They claimed they were the true church. They, did, they didn't separate from Rome, but Rome separated from them. Uh, there were Christians around who did not always see eye to eye with the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. So In fact, there were a number of them. You believe these earlier groups, the Waldenses and the Albigenses, were Christians? Yeah, many of them were. I've read their writings and uh, studied their history, and they were willing to die for their faith. The Paulicians also uh, go back uh, into Armenia and other places way back as early as the fourth century. They believed also they were continuing the true church and opposed, they opposed everything about the papal church and looked upon it as the Antichrist. The belief that these earlier groups were in fact Christians was held by nearly all of the reformers, including men like John Wycliffe, Martin Luther, John Calvin, and many others. In fact, many Christians are familiar with the idea of America as a city on a hill. Well, that speech was originally given by Governor John Winthrop, who was one of the founders of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And as he and the other Puritans came to the New World, he gave this speech about America or they themselves as a city on a hill. But at the beginning of that speech, he makes reference to the Waldenses uh, as an example of Christian charity. In his speech, Winthrop said, We are a company professing ourselves fellow members of Christ. We ought to account ourselves knit together by this bond of love and live in the exercise of it. This was notorious in the practice of the Christians in former times, as is testified of the Waldenses. They used to love any of their own religion, even before they were acquainted with them. Nevertheless, modern histories continue to report that these early Bible believers were heretics who believed in occult doctrines. What do you say to people who present those modern historic arguments? Well, I would say first of all that a lot of our history comes from Rome. We have to recognize that. 
Uh, it was old uh, Gibbon who said that uh, when the wars are fought, the victors tell the story. I'm not giving his words exactly, but that's the gist of what he says. Uh, he says, in other words, it is the victors who tell the story. So if you're a defeated Christian small group, then you are, your story is told from the standpoint of those who conquered you. And Pelican, the modern uh, American scholar, says, and there is no other way many times to tell the story. The common charge against the Waldenses and Albigenses is that these groups held to unorthodox ideas about God and that they were guilty of what was called the Manichaean heresy. The Manichaeans believed they were dualists. They believed in a God of good and a God of evil. And that was one of the great heresies uh, of the church. In time, the word Manichaean came to be a general term for heresy, but did not necessarily mean that a person actually believed the doctrines of the Manichaeans. When Martin Luther began the Reformation, the Synod of Sens accused him of being a Manichaean. In fact, modern historian S.J. Barnett writes that during and after the Reformation, Catholic propagandists hoped to undermine the legitimacy of Protestantism. Catholic apologists usually designated Luther and Calvin as Manichaean heretics from the third century dualist heresy. When they couldn't find anything wrong with a so-called heretic, they would charge them with Manichaeanism because that was, that was always punishable by death. So if I couldn't find out that you were a heretic in some other way, then I would just charge you as being a Manichaean and that way I could put you to death and I didn't have to prove a whole lot of other things against you. So that was one of the tactics of Rome was to charge whatever groups were being charged with whatever heresies they were being investigated for, to charge them with Manichaeanism so that the, their case could be made easier and they could be shown to be true heretics. So you cannot take a lot of the information that we get. You have to certainly uh, investigate it thoroughly to find out what these groups believe. They refused to acknowledge the dogmas or the ideas or the doctrines that were being promoted by men that weren't biblical. And so they took a biblical position and because of their biblical position, they were persecuted. As we said earlier, most of the reformers believed that the charges of heresy against these earlier groups were falsely created by Rome to justify her persecutions. Yet most Protestant historians believe that the Waldenses and the Albigenses were forerunners of the Reformation. 19th century historian William Jones wrote that to justify the Waldenses and Albigenses is indeed to defend the Reformation and reformers, they having so long before us with an exemplary courage labored to preserve the Christian religion in its ancient purity, which the Church of Rome all this while has endeavored to abolish. To be more specific, it would be more accurate to say that the popes have endeavored to abolish biblical Christianity in favor of a religious system of their own making. And because of this, they have seen the Bible as their chief enemy. And this is the reason why they outlawed it from being read by the common people. Throughout history, they gave different pronouncements of saying that you can't give these holy things to the swine. And they use that scripture as, as completely bogus. Uh, pearls before swine doesn't have anything to do with giving 
uh, the life-giving scripture to the people, but the Roman Catholic Church just looked at the, uh, looked at the common man as, as pigs who could not possibly understand the scriptures. Because of this, Martin Luther, and eventually the rest of the reformers, came to believe that the Pope was the fulfillment of biblical warnings concerning the greatest enemy of Christ. If you make a study of the life of Luther, you'll find that there was a very slow transition from 1517 when he nailed the 90. And they set about trying to prove all the flaws they could to the world. And at the same time, they officially declared through Vatican Council I that the Pope was infallible. So their message was clear. Don't trust the Bible, trust the Pope. The Bible's a flawed book. The Pope is infallible. And so this brought everything full circle to the conflict that had been raging for hundreds of years throughout the Middle Ages. And that's ultimately what their meeting in Chieri, Italy was all about. The information discussed by Jesuit leaders in Chieri was published in 1848 by a former Jesuit initiate named Jacopo Leone. His book was titled The Jesuit Conspiracy, The Secret Plan of the Order. In it, he claimed to have overheard the plans of Jesuit leaders and was compelled to write down the information and publish it as a warning to the rest of the world. Leone wrote specifically of how the Jesuits intended to take control of the Bible. Allegedly, they said, then the Bible, that serpent which, with head erect and eyes flashing fire, threatens us with its venom, shall be changed again into a rod as soon as we are able to seize it. O oh, then mysterious rod, we will not again suffer thee to escape from our hands. For you know too well that for three centuries past, this cruel asp has left us no repose. You well know with what folds it entwines us and with what fangs it gnaws us. According to Leone, one of the Jesuits openly admitted that the scriptures do not support the Roman Catholic faith. Speaking of the Bible, he said, if I may tell you openly what I think of this book, it is not at all for us, it is against us. I do not wonder at the invincible obstinacy it engenders in all those who regard its verses as inspired. In the simplicity of youth, I fully expected on opening the New Testament to find there the authority of a superior chief in the church, the worship of the Virgin, the mass, purgatory, relics, but in every page I found my expectations disappointed. At last, after having read at least six times over that little book, I was forced to acknowledge to myself that it actually sets forth a system of religion altogether different. What this Jesuit priest acknowledged all the way back in the 19th century is the same thing that the reformers acknowledged. Uh, they noticed that the teachings of the Bible and the teachings of the Pope were dramatically different. The difference is that the reformers uh, chose to follow the Bible while the Jesuits chose to fight against it on behalf of the traditions and power of the Catholic Church. The view of the Jesuits toward the Bible could be likened to that of the ancient Pharisees 2,000 years ago who opposed Christ. As Jesus said of them, full well ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. And again he said, in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. At their meeting in Chieri in 1825, the Jesuits discussed the methods to be used in their ongoing counter-reformation and their plan 
for the subversion of the Bible. They said specifically that a few breaches made in Protestantism, whether these conversions proceed from genuine motives or whether they be determined by advantageous offers, which shall not be spared if the person be worth the trouble. We ought by every possible means to secure the aid of modern thinkers. If they can be induced to write at all in our favor, let us pay them well, either in money or in laudation. The Jesuits, since the Middle Ages, have been known for seducing people uh, outside the Catholic Church, even members of Protestant churches, and making deals with them to help the cause of Rome. And this was especially revealed in the 19th century during what was called the Oxford Movement in England. And it was in the wake of this movement that the Vatican really pushed to try and take control of the Bible. And that's why it's so important to understand what the Oxford Movement was all about. In 1833, the Oxford Movement started. That's perhaps not without significance that um, we're not only looking at what Rome is doing, we have to consider that the Lord himself will bring, bring judgment on uh, a nation that forsakes him and, uh, and forsakes the, the word of God. The Oxford Movement was an attempt effectively to Romanize the Church of England and to get the Church of England away from the scriptures, from the King James Bible and back to the ritualistic practices of Rome. Now it was done in a very subtle manner um, and it really typified the Jesuit approach of Bishop Orton which is above all not too much zeal and it, it uh, tried to portray the true position of the Church of England as a sort of a middle of the road um, organization but at the same time it, it did promote uh, what it called um, a high view of the sacraments so that uh, although it professed to be against what it regarded as extreme Protestants that is to say Bible believing evangelicals and uh, also what it regarded as uh, extreme um, Romanism say the persecutions of, uh, of by Catholicism and so on the Inquisition perhaps nevertheless it sought gradually by publications of what were called tracts for our times to give a favorable view uh, to things like um, the Roman Mass. In 1898, a man named Walter Walsh published a book titled The Secret History of the Oxford Movement. In it, he writes about the activities of the Jesuits in England. He recorded the testimony of a former Catholic priest who told him, in England, there are a greater number of Jesuits than in Italy. There are Jesuits in all classes of society, in Parliament, among the English clergy, among the Protestant laity, even in the higher stations. He went on to say, I could not comprehend how a Jesuit could be a Protestant or how a Protestant could be a Jesuit. But my confessor silenced my scruples by telling me, that St. Paul became as a Jew, that he might save the Jews. It was no wonder, therefore, if a Jesuit should feign himself a Protestant for the conversion of Protestants. Within less than 20 years after the Oxford movement, another movement began in the world of biblical scholarship that would almost completely transform the understanding of the Bible. This transformation would be affected by men who were of the Protestant profession, but strangely worked in cooperation with Rome. <laughs> 
prior to the 19th century. Protestant scholars depended on a collection of Greek manuscripts that had come into Europe after the fall of Constantinople in 1453. Collectively, these manuscripts would form the foundation of the New Testament Greek used by the reformers. By men like William Tyndale, Martin Luther, the Geneva Bible translators, and the translation team for the King James Version of 1611. These Greek manuscripts were collated first by Erasmus of Rotterdam. Erasmus would lay the foundation for the traditional text and further the belief that the scripture should be read by all people. To translate to, to French, to English, to German at this time, because it was very important for Erasmus that uh, everybody can read the, the, the Bible in his uh, own speaking. He produced five editions of his translation in 1516, uh, 1519, uh, 1522, 1529, and 1535. For the, the first edition, uh, all the edition was published in Basel. The Erasmus 1522, it was really revolutionary because here we have in this column, and just the beautiful artwork, but in this column, you have the Greek and what Erasmus did that really blew people out of the water. Most people could not read Greek back then, but many of them could read Latin. The scholars could read Latin. He took the Greek and he translated it into Latin. And so many people had their eyes open because they started reading Erasmus's new translation of the Latin from the Greek and they found out that it was completely different than what they had in the Latin Vulgate of the Roman Catholic Church. Then yes. you'll see here MDXXII, that is 1522. And so this is Erasmus's um, second or third edition? This is Erasmus's third edition. Uh, it is the foundation for Texas Receptus. Uh, then we come to Luke again, uh, the Latin and uh, the Greek that Erasmus had translated. Uh, we can go all the way back to the Apocalypse. Uh, this, is, this is the Acts of the Apostles right here, but it, of course, goes all the way through page after page after page. There we go, the Apocalypse, Revelation. The work begun by Erasmus would be later continued by Robert Stephanus, whose 1550 Greek edition would be used for the Geneva Bible. In time, his work would be furthered by the famed Calvinist scholar, Theodore Beza. Beza's 1598 Greek New Testament was chiefly used for the King James Version of 1611 but it would be some years later that the Elzevir brothers in Holland would publish the work even further and give the reformers Greek its official name. In the introduction of their 1633 edition, they wrote, what you have here is the text which is now received by all in which we give nothing changed or corrupted. Hence the Greek of the Protestant Reformation would become known as Textus Receptus, the received text. So that becomes the standard Greek for Protestant scholars and remains so for nearly 300 years. But in the 19th century, a German scholar named Konstantin von Tischendorf would publish what would become known as the most ancient biblical manuscript ever recovered. His discovery would turn the world of Bible scholarship upside down, convincing many that his manuscript was a lost version of the Bible. You have to go back before that uh, with German higher criticism, uh, and they developed a, a theory uh, called the recension theory, and uh, in this recension theory, they, they say that the Bible 
uh, Bible was lost. The recension theory was introduced by a man named Johann Semler in the 18th century. One of his disciples, Jacob Griesbach, would popularize his theory among German intellectuals. Both Semler and Griesbach held to unorthodox views of Christianity, to say the least. Uh, Semler is known as the father of German rationalism, and he clearly influenced Griesbach. Rationalism in Germany is very much like the Enlightenment in France, where they rejected the idea of the divinity of Christ because they rejected the supernatural elements of the Bible, you know, the virgin birth, uh, Christ being raised from the dead, Him ascending into heaven, and so on. All of that to them in France, it was unreasonable because of the reason movement, well, in Germany, it was irrational, hence the term rationalism. So they believed it was irrational to believe those things, so they rejected them. And this was the view of both Semler and Griesbach. So Semler and Griesbach were two men who essentially rejected the gospel. And the rationalism that they were known for took hold in Germany, and Germany then became the epicenter for higher criticism against the Bible. The concentration of activity in Germany is believed to have been the working of the Jesuits, whose aim was to destroy the confidence of Protestants in the inerrancy of Scripture. This was acknowledged by Dr. Ian Paisley, who had this to say about the ongoing war waged by Rome and the Jesuits against the Bible. And it's not the word of man, it's the word of God. Now, of course, Rome used to burn the Bible. She used to burn the people that translated them. She used to burn the people that read them. But that didn't succeed. So she decided upon another scheme, that she would place her Jesuit priests in the training of Protestant ministers. And so into the universities of Germany, Rome set at work the whole structure of unbelieving higher criticism. And she had in the universities men who sought to destroy belief in the Bible. And we became cursed with what was known as higher criticism. And young men of their faith in the Bible destroyed in the universities and in the training colleges. And so the men that came out to be ordained didn't believe the book. They didn't believe the creeds of the church. They didn't believe in the historic Christian faith. And they set to work to destroy the faith. With that spirit of of uh, textual criticism and non-belief in the inspiration of the Word of God, looking at the Bible just like any other book, uh, uh, scholars and even, quote, Christian scholars began to follow that line. Textual criticism in the proper sense is not necessarily a bad thing. Textual criticism is a word that is used to assess the value of one Greek manuscript over another. That's what it is. It's, it's a bringing of the, the manuscripts together and then showing which is the one to go with and which is the one not to go with. The practice of textual criticism began in the Middle Ages and grew out of the conflicts between Rome and the Protestant Reformation. It is most often traced to a 17th century scholar named Richard Simon. He's the one who uh, is alleged to have really begun this, this whole process. Uh, he's called the father of textual criticism. He was a French Roman Catholic priest. In the world today, textual criticism can mean several different things depending on who's using that term and how it's being applied. Uh, you have textual criticism in the ordinary sense, which is simply a process of going through ancient manuscripts collating them and trying to remove any errors and trying to figure out what the original text was and what it should be. 
Then you have what is known as higher criticism, which is where you give a historical analysis of the manuscripts. And then you begin to question whether or not Moses could have really written the book of Genesis or whether Peter could have written the epistles ascribed to him. And you begin to question the authorship and the, and the historical nature of the Bible. And this was the process that is usually traced to Richard Simon. Simon entered the priesthood in 1670. He was initially educated by Jesuit priests, and then later at the Sorbonne in Paris. He would go on to enter the congregation of the oratory. The purpose of the oratory was said to be to interpose a barrier to the continuous and disquieting progress of Protestantism. All of the orders that Simon was involved with, uh, whether the Jesuits or the Sorbonne in Paris and then the Oratory, they were all involved in variant forms of the Counter-Reformation. They were all looking for different ways to try and overthrow the Protestant movement. Yet Simon's focus was guided by the Jesuits from the beginning. It was they who laid the foundation for Simon's work through one of their original members, Alfonso Salmeron, who had joined with Ignatius Loyola in 1534. We read that Salmeron paved the way for Richard Simon. The Jesuits introduced into Catholic reading of the Bible the parameters of time, place, context, and semantic structures. The idea of applying principles of time and context don't necessarily sound like a bad thing until you realize how they were being used as weapons to try and undermine the Bible. One example was a book that was written by another Roman Catholic named Isaac La Perere during the same era. And he had written a book called Men Before Adam in 1655, in which he argued that supposedly a new information, scientific data that had come to light from Greenland and China and so on, proved that men lived on the earth as far back as 50,000 BC, thus throwing into jeopardy the traditional date for creation in Genesis, which goes back to about 4,000 BC. We read that La Perere deployed the hypothesis of men before Adam in order to attack the Calvinist method of interpreting scripture according to the literal sense. And so the idea of higher criticism, uh, which grew out of this movement, and is also called historic criticism, the idea behind it is to arrange certain dates in history around the Bible in such a way to make it appear that the Bible is not a historically accurate book, therefore cannot possibly be the inspired inerrant word of God. That's the whole point of it. La Perere's work would have a powerful influence over Richard Simon, who would further the assault against Reformed teaching. We read that Simon sharpened historical criticism into a weapon that could be used in the attack on Protestantism's most fundamental error, the doctrine of sola scriptura. Sola Scriptura was one of the mottos of the Reformation, and it means only the Scripture. And it's the idea that the Christian faith should be based on the teachings of the Bible alone without any interference with the doctrines or teachings of men. And it's in contrast to the Roman Catholic teaching, which says that church tradition should govern the understanding of the Bible, even if the two disagree. In defense of his Catholic faith, Richard Simon wrote that the great changes that have taken place in the manuscripts of the Bible since the first originals were lost completely destroy the principle of the Protestants. If tradition is not joined to scripture, there is hardly anything in religion that one can confidently affirm.
but the Bible says of itself that the scriptures alone are sufficient for the spiritual needs of all believers. The Apostle Paul wrote that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Furthermore, God promises that he will preserve his words eternally and that they cannot be lost. The psalmist writes, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Jesus said, The scriptures cannot be broken. And heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. For all flesh is grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And in many ways you can define the conflict between uh, Catholicism and Protestantism as a conflict between the authority of the Pope versus the authority of the Bible. And this is the whole reason why the Bible came to be known as the paper pope of Protestantism. That was the name given to it by the Catholics. And these arguments against the Bible uh, were especially active in the 19th century during the same era that Constantine von Tischendorf went searching for his ancient texts. The hostility of Catholics toward the Protestant Bible was written of by 19th century historian John Dowling in his book, The Burning of the Bibles, where he documented how Catholics in Champlain, New York, were burning Bibles in America back in 1843. The beliefs of Catholics during the 19th and early 20th century can be shown by the teaching of Cardinal James Gibbons, pictured here with President Theodore Roosevelt. Gibbons was the Archbishop of Baltimore, and in his book, Faith of Our Fathers, he wrote, Now the scriptures alone do not contain all the truths which a Christian is bound to believe, because they do not contain all the truths necessary for salvation. A similar view had been espoused in England by Cardinal John Henry Newman, perhaps the leading Catholic apologist of the 19th century. Speaking of the Bible, he said, Surely the sacred volume was never intended to teach us our creed, and from the first it has been the error of heretics to attempt of themselves a work to which they are unequal, the eliciting of a systematic doctrine from the scattered notices of truth which scripture contains. Essentially what Newman is saying is that the error of the heretics, so-called, was that they followed the example of the ancient Bereans who searched the scriptures daily to test the things that they were hearing. And this is something that the Church of Rome has always discouraged. One of Newman's contemporaries was a renowned priest named Thomas Edward Bridget, who said that true faith was a surrender of the mind to a living authority known to be divine, not a puzzle over documents with doubt about correct interpretation. Even the modern Catholic encyclopedia openly declares that the supremacy of the Bible as source of faith is unhistorical, illogical, fatal to the virtue of faith, and destructive of unity. So we see that Rome's view of the Bible has not changed in a thousand years. The reformers in their day were trying to recover uh, the ancient scripture in such a way that they could have a full understanding of the Word of God. 
But in contrast, the Church of Rome went about looking for weaknesses in the text so that the Protestant doctrine of sola scriptura could be overthrown. That's the difference. They were losing people very rapidly because of the text that was preserved by the priesthood of believers. Because they were losing people from the Roman Catholic See, from their authority, they had to do something to counter that influence. But while they were fighting against Sola Scriptura, they were at the same time arguing in defense of the Latin Vulgate, which had been declared by the Council of Trent to be the only true authoritative scripture. And they also condemned uh, Luther's conclusion that Jerome's Vulgate was a corrupt Bible, uh, which we know it is, and they further condemned Luther's um, conclusion that to uh, produce a pure a Bible, either in German or English or any other language, you did have to go back to what today we would call the traditional text. That is, for example, the Greek text of the New Testament, which is found in the vast majority of surviving Greek manuscripts. In their introduction to the Douay Reims Bible, the Jesuit scholars wrote, we see that by all means, the old vulgar Latin translation is approved, good, and better than the Greek text itself, and that there is no cause why it should give place to any other text, copies, or readings. 16th century Anglican scholar William Whitaker said that, the papists contend that their Latin text is authentic of itself and ought not to be tried by the text of the originals. Meanwhile, Protestant scholar Francis Turretin summed up the debate this way. He said, the question is whether the original text in Hebrew or in Greek has been so corrupted either by the carelessness of copyists or by the malice of the Jews and heretics that it can no longer be held as the judge by which all versions are to be judged. The Roman Catholics affirm this, we deny it. So Rome's position, according to Turretin, was that the Greek and the Hebrew manuscripts had been so corrupted over time that they could not be trusted. And therefore, you shouldn't use those manuscripts to correct the Latin Vulgate, which is what Erasmus had done back right before the Reformation began. And that was their main issue. We also read that in the preface of the Douay, Roman Catholics contended that the Latin Vulgate was translated from the Hebrew and Greek texts when they were more pure. Therefore, many contended that the Vulgate version was dictated by the Holy Spirit, was consequently of divine authority and more to be regarded than even the original Hebrew and Greek texts. Hence, the Jesuit scholars at Reims concluded that the Latin Vulgate is not only better than all other Latin translations, but than the Greek text itself in those places where they disagree. So the Catholic arguments against Sola Scriptura were operating on two fronts. The first part was to discredit the Greek and the Hebrew manuscripts as being so full of corruptions and errors that they could not be trusted, thus proving that the Latin Vulgate alone is the superior text. And step two, to argue that because the Bible is so difficult to interpret, it is necessary to rely on church tradition and the infallible teachings of the Pope. So this is the academic environment that had developed for several hundred years before Tischendorf shows up in 1844. Now Tischendorf had embraced the recension theory, this idea that the Bible was lost and needed to be found. Then you add to that, you had Catholic scholars like Cardinal Wiseman 
who argued that the truest representation of the Bible would be found in the Latin Vulgate. And all of these elements came together in the 19th century, and this is what inspired Tischendorf to take his famous journey. Tischendorf's efforts were clearly aimed against the traditional Greek text. In 1866, he would write that, we have at last hit upon a better plan, which is to set aside this textus receptus altogether and to construct a fresh text. The curious thing about that quote is that when Tischendorf says, we have hit upon a better plan. Who does he mean by we? It sounds as though he was working with somebody else, but he doesn't exactly say who. For years prior to his journey, Tischendorf had been influenced by a prominent Catholic scholar named Nicholas Cardinal Wiseman. Cardinal Wiseman developed a theory that old Latin texts had been developed in North Africa by the second century. Wiseman's assertion seems to have been an attempt to try and prove that the Latin Vulgate was closer to the original manuscripts than any known Greek manuscript at that time. And it was this theory that made Tischendorf partial to the Latin Vulgate. We read that in 1842, while at Paris, Tischendorf prepared an edition of the New Testament intended for the use of Catholics, giving the Latin Vulgate and a Greek text, rendered as far as possible conformable to it in parallel columns. So what Tischendorf did is he developed a Greek manuscript that would conform to the Latin Vulgate. He essentially reversed the work of Erasmus of Rotterdam from 300 years earlier. Remember, Erasmus had collated the Greek manuscripts and then published the first ever parallel Bible with the Greek in one column and the Latin in the other. And he used the Greek to correct the errors in the Latin. Well, now, hundreds of years later, Tischendorf reverses the process. He does a parallel Bible, but he does it the other way. He uses the Latin to correct the Greek. And he did this work for the Catholic Archbishop of Paris, Archbishop Afre. And so it shows his relationship with the Catholic Church at this time. It's also worth mentioning that one of Tischendorf's critics said that Tischendorf only understood Greek through Latin. Tischendorf would make his great discovery in 1844 when he arrived at St. Catherine's Monastery at the base of what is called Mount Sinai in Egypt. But before he arrived, he took a journey to Rome and was received at the Vatican. In his memoirs, Tischendorf wrote, I here pass over in silence the interesting details of my travels, my audience with the Pope, Gregory XVI, in May 1843, my intercourse with Cardinal Mezzofanti, that surprising and celebrated linguist. Mezzofanti was famous for his ability to speak more than 50 languages fluently. Tischendorf wrote that, Mezzofanti honored me with some Greek verses composed in my praise. Tischendorf was well favored by Rome, which is odd considering his status as a Protestant scholar. Yeah, I can never quite figure that out, uh, why uh, a Protestant scholar or one who claimed to be a Protestant scholar uh, would be meeting with, with the Pope over the situation. Uh, there's a lot of unanswer un unanswered questions 
And not just anybody goes to meet in a private audience with the Pope. It's like going to meet the president or a prime minister or someone of that position. And then we have this famous Catholic cardinal, Mezzo Fonte, writing him a poem in Greek to praise him as this great scholar and so on. It's all very strange. But Tischendorf was welcomed into Rome by some of the leading Catholic authorities of that time. In fact, in his memoirs, he reveals that it was Archbishop Afre of Paris for whom he had prepared the parallel Bible that gave him his recommendation to the Vatican. And then he was received by Pope Gregory. Tischendorf wrote, Gregory XVI, after a prolonged audience granted to me, took an ardent interest in my undertaking. Pope Gregory's interest in Tischendorf is curious, especially when you consider that it was the same Pope Gregory that openly condemned the Protestant Bible societies of that time. In 1843, American author John Dowling wrote that the present Pope, Gregory XVI, and his predecessor, Pope Leo XII, denounced all Bible societies, declaring that by the Bibles they distributed, they converted the gospel of Christ into a human gospel, or what is still worse, the gospel of the devil. In his encyclical against the Bible societies, Pope Gregory wrote, We have taken great pains to remind the faithful of the ancient laws concerning vernacular translations of the scriptures. The Pope's wording is suspicious because it was the ancient laws of the Roman Church that had Bible believers burned at the stake for reading or handling the Word of God. But could this have been what Pope Gregory was referring to in his writing. Several years after Tischendorf's private audience at the Vatican, it was discovered that the Inquisition had continued underground in the ancient city. Charles Spurgeon, known to millions as the Prince of Preachers, documented the manner of torture that had been reported once the papal dungeons were revealed. From Spurgeon's publication, The Sword and the Trowel, we read that, they invented ovens or furnaces, which being made red hot, they lowered the condemned into them, bound hand and foot, and immediately closed over them the mouth of the furnace. This barbarous punishment was substituted for the burning pile, and in 1849, these furnaces at Rome were laid open to the public view in the dungeons of the Holy Roman Inquisition, near the great church of the Vatican, still containing the calcined bones. What's disturbing is that these things were revealed in 1849, just six years after Tischendorf visited the Pope. And it was only revealed because the great general Garibaldi and his revolutionaries captured Rome that year and opened the papal dungeons. But then you have a quote from W.C. Brownlee that was published in 1843, the same year Tischendorf was at the Vatican. And Brownlee says, the Inquisition, the infernal Inquisition, he says, even at this day is in full operation in Rome under the patronage of Pope Gregory XVI, the same Pope that Constantine von Tischendorf met with. So while Tischendorf was in Rome, with his cardinal writing him poetry to praise him and so on, there were people, some of them quite probably Christians, who were still being tortured for heresy in the underground inquisition nearby. And they were being roasted alive in these ovens right next door to the Vatican. Yeah, yes, the Inquisition, actually not just in Italy, but in other places, went well into the 1800s. Discoveries of the Inquisition during this era were also exposed by Dr. H. Grattan Guinness in the convent of Santo Domingo, Mexico, in 1861. He published these photographs 
of the remains of victims who had been walled up and buried alive. The expressions of their torment still recorded in their countenance. Charles Spurgeon wrote that the Inquisition was the masterpiece of infernal craft and malice. There is a deep and indelible sentence of damnation written upon the apostate church for its more than infernal cruelties, and the curse is registered in heaven. Nor can any pretenses to present liberality reverse the condemnation. Its infamy is engraven in the rock forever. Rome did many, many, many evil and hateful things. Yet somehow, during this era, the Protestant Tischendorf was not only accepted by Rome, but received special treatment from the Vatican and her priests. Tischendorf's cooperation with the Vatican was a dramatic departure from the resistance maintained by other Protestant ministers of that era. Grattan Guinness called Rome the masterpiece of Satan and maintained that she had never repented of her crimes. In 1873, Charles Spurgeon wrote that the superstition of Rome is the worst of all the evils which have befallen our race May the Lord arise and sweep it down to the hell from whence it arose. Spurgeon was so convicted against the papacy that he once declared, Popery is abhorred of the Lord, and they who help it wear the mark of the beast. Yet in Rome, Tischendorf was not only welcomed by the Pope, but by two of the leading cardinals of that time. The first was the well-known linguist Mezzofanti, while the other was a Jesuit named Cardinal Angelo Mai. During the 19th century, Mai was the cardinal librarian for the Vatican Library and was credited with recovering many ancient manuscripts that pertained to church history. It was said that there is not a single century of the Christian era from the second to the 17th from which he has not produced important and previously unknown works. He had transcribed all with his own hand entirely by himself. This quote about the Jesuit uh, Cardinal Mai is very interesting because it shows us the nature of the times. And so you've got Cardinal Mai there, who very much like Tischendorf. Tischendorf is out journeying, trying to gather all of these ancient manuscripts. At the same time, Cardinal Mai is going through old Vatican records and he's producing all of these works that nobody had ever seen before that have to do with the history of the church. Now what's disturbing about this is that the collective efforts of both Cardinal Mai and Tischendorf would end up dramatically changing the academic world's view of the Bible from that time forward. During the same time that Tischendorf was discovering the first manuscript that would change everyone's perception about the Greek text, Cardinal Mai was in Rome working on the other manuscript that would accomplish the same thing, and, uh, and that was the Vatican's version of the Bible, a Codex Vaticanus, which today is, is considered supreme over all of the other Greek biblical manuscripts anywhere in the world. What we have here is uh, the Vatican manuscript, also called Codex B, but I have it opened to a very important uh, section. And you can see the Vatican seal here. This is an exact facsimile. But before Vaticanus would emerge to dominate the world of biblical scholarship, 
the travels of Constantine von Tischendorf would yield the fruit of his great ambition. In his memoirs, he wrote, it was in April, 1844, that I embarked at Leghorn for Egypt. The desire which I felt to discover some precious remains of any manuscripts, more especially biblical, of a date which would carry us back to the early times of Christianity was realized beyond my expectations. It was at the foot of Mount Sinai in the convent of St. Catherine that I discovered the pearl of all my researches. Tischendorf tells of how he discovered this manuscript in a trash basket inside the convent. The monks had been using its pages as fuel for the fire. He wrote, I perceived in the middle of the great hall a large and wide basket full of old parchments, and the librarian told me that two heaps of papers like this had been already committed to the flames. What was my surprise to find amid this heap of papers a considerable number of sheets of a copy of the Old Testament in Greek, which seemed to me to be one of the most ancient that I had ever seen. Uh, he's visiting the monastery in 1844, and uh, he's under the patronage and sponsorship of uh, Frederick Augustus, King of Saxony. And while he's there, he discovers an old manuscript in a, in a rubbish basket, and they were basically using it uh, as tinder to start, to start fires. According to his own testimony, once he recognized the manuscript for its ancient value, Tischendorf responded quickly and was able to rescue many of the pages from being burned. He wrote, the authorities of the convent allowed me to possess myself of a third of these parchments as they were destined for the fire, but I could not get them to yield up possession of the remainder. The too lively satisfaction which I had displayed had aroused their suspicions as to the value of this manuscript. In total, Tischendorf recovered some 43 pages. When he returned from his journey, he chose to publish the pages, but secretly. He wrote, I did not divulge the name of the place where I had found it, in the hopes of returning and recovering the rest of the manuscript. So Tischendorf published his Old Testament portion of the Sinai Codex, but he continued to believe that the New Testament portion of the manuscript was probably still somewhere inside St. Catherine's Monastery. Then he says he returned again in 1853 uh, and didn't find anything. So he finally uh, goes back and in 1859, he's able to get, well, the remainder. It was during Tischendorf's third journey to St. Catherine's Monastery in 1859 that he made his most famous discovery. Tischendorf says that he was taking a walk with the steward of the convent and that they returned to his room at some point. Well, they were talking about the Septuagint and he says, I too have read a Septuagint, meaning a Greek version of the Old Testament. Uh, so then he pulls out this bulky manuscript that was supposedly wrapped in red cloth and he shows it to Tischendorf. Tischendorf wrote, I unrolled the cover and discovered to my great surprise not only those very fragments which 15 years before I had taken out of the basket, but also other parts of the Old Testament and the New Testament complete. I knew that I held in my hand the most precious biblical treasure in existence, a document whose age and importance exceeded that of all the manuscripts which I had ever examined during 20 years of study on the subject.
Tischendorf would transcribe and eventually publish the manuscript under the name Codex Sinaiticus. In relationship to uh, the Sinaiticus uh, manuscript, uh, it's uh, republished by Cursop Lake in the 1800s. Uh, in the Old Testament portion, you can see what appears to be even burn marks on, on some of uh, the leaves that um, were recovered. That almost looks like he pulled that right out of the fire, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. See, here's... So this certainly confirms his story, or it seems to, that they were throwing these pages in yeah. the flames. Yeah, well, they were using it uh, like we use newspaper to start a fire. Uh, this was old, it was brittle. So made made good to start a fire there in the cool mornings and evenings at the monastery. Once Sinaiticus was fully published, Tischendorf became a world-famous scholar, practically overnight. Nearly all the courts of Europe showered honors and distinctions on him for his great discovery. So much so, said his son-in-law, that they could not all fit on one man's chest. Oxford and Cambridge universities honored him with their highest degrees. In the midst of all this, a copy of Sinaiticus was sent to the Pope, who wrote Tischendorf an autograph letter congratulating him. Tischendorf even mentioned how an old man of distinguished learning had said, I would rather have discovered this Sinaitic manuscript than the Koh-i-Noor of the Queen of England. The Koh-i-Noor was the famed diamond of India that was in possession of the English throne. And it's interesting because that's exactly how Tischendorf described his manuscript, as a diamond, he says, in his possession. And for him it was. Because of the Codex Sinaiticus, Constantine von Tischendorf would go on to become one of the most famous men of the academic world, and perhaps the most celebrated paleographer of all time. And it's an interesting contrast. On the one hand, you've got the reformers who are being persecuted and killed by the Church of Rome because of their faith in the Word of God, while on the other hand, you've got Tischendorf who's being lauded by the Pope and celebrated like a prince upon the earth for his discovery. In the book of Revelation, the scripture says concerning the great harlot, Mystery Babylon, that by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. As part of their counter-reformation, the Jesuits created many fraudulent and forged documents. When they could not persuade others by ordinary means, they would literally create historic evidence to support their claims. Sometimes they dug up old bones, pretending that they belonged to some saint. And sometimes they created fake documents. 19th century British historian Thomas Carlyle said that Jesuitism has poisoned the wellsprings of truth in the whole world. Yet long before the Jesuit order was formed, Rome herself 
had an ancient practice of fraud and deception. What was the purpose of creating all these forgeries? Well, I think it was the uh, enabling the the Pope, the claims to the papal claims to having absolute power. Uh, anything that could buttress those claims, and that's why they came in. Perhaps the most famous forgery in Rome's long history was the donation of Constantine, a document alleging that the Emperor Constantine the Great gave all the lands of the Western Roman Empire to the Pope as the vicar of the Son of God. The donation of Constantine, according to Renaissance scholars who first began to expose some of these documents, Lorenzo Vallo, for example, tells us that that document could not have been written in the fourth century. Today, it is agreed by Catholic and Protestant scholars alike that the donation was a forgery, most likely created between the 8th and 9th century AD. Developed alongside the donation were the Decretals of Isidore, also known as the False Decretals. This elaborate forgery involved a series of letters from early figures in church history, from Clement in the first century to Gregory the Great in the sixth and seventh century. The letters filled more than 700 pages and were cleverly interwoven with real historic documents to give them credibility. The diabolical genius of the false decretals is that it was truth mixed with lies, and it was very elaborately done. If you go into the 11th century, when you have Gratian and his compilation of the canons, you'll discover that in support of papal power, out of something like 330 quotations, 313 of those sources of authority come from those false uh, distorted documents. Uh, the Jesuits uh, held them back, and, but they finally came to view that many of these uh, documents were forgeries and they were forged specifically to give Rome power and so that they would be looked upon as the true church and as the seat of the papacy and that this was what the church had written about and what the church supported when in fact they were all forged. The Decretals of Isidore became the cornerstone of canon law during the Middle Ages. They would be used to deceive the church for more than 600 years until they were finally exposed by Calvinist scholar David Blondell in 1628. But the false decretals and the donation of Constantine are said to be just two of the countless forgeries created by Rome. They're all basically the same. They're the same as the dictatus pape of uh, Gregory the Seventh, in which they are claims made about papal power. Pope Gregory the Seventh was perhaps the most notorious forger ever admitted to by Catholic historians. In the 11th century, he drafted his dictatus, or list, of papal privileges. Among his 27 points, he declared the following. The Pope can be judged by no one on earth. The Roman Church has never erred, nor can it err until the end of time. The Pope alone can dethrone emperors and kings and absolve their subjects from allegiance. And all princes are obliged to kiss his feet. To support these ideas, Gregory relied upon the forged documents of the past, but chose to go even farther and create his own history for the church and the world. In the book, Vicars of Christ, former Jesuit priest Peter de Rosa writes of Pope Gregory VII 
and his school of forgers. He says, for seven centuries, the Greeks had called Rome the home of forgeries. Whenever they tried talking with Rome, the popes brought out forged documents, which the Greeks naturally had never seen. De Rosa says, Gregory went way beyond the donation of Constantine. He had a whole school of forgers under his very nose, turning out document after document with the papal seal of approval to cater for his every need. Pope Gregory might require justification for some action against a prince or bishop. Very well, these prelates literally produced the appropriate document. No need for research, it was all done on the premises. Many earlier documents were touched up to make them say the opposite of what they said originally. Some of these earlier documents were themselves forgeries. This instant method of inventing history was marvelously successful, especially as the forgeries were at once inserted into canon law. Thus was accomplished the quietest and longest lasting of all revolutions. It was all done on paper. They propagated deceptions early on, and I believe those deceptions continue right up into the 20th century. Evidence that Rome continued her forgeries into modern times can be shown in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. In 1873, Charles Spurgeon documented how the relic department of the Vatican had been exposed for manufacturing false relics and presenting them as the bones of various saints of old. We read that, so far back as 1828, this trade was going on, with pieces of bones of sheep and hares, or of human bones, taken from the catacombs, but such as were probably those of pagans, certainly not of saints and martyrs, whose names they affixed to them. Spurgeon went on to say that the Jesuits play a prominent part in these transactions, as they do in most Catholic affairs. Then, in the 20th century, it appears that Jesuit deception played a role in the 1912 discovery of the Piltdown Man, which was declared to be the missing link that would prove Darwin's theory of evolution. But 40 years after its discovery, Piltdown was proven to be a hoax. The chief culprit in the deception was said to be Charles Dawson, an amateur British archaeologist who sought fame and glory. Yet Dawson did not work alone. His helper was a Jesuit priest named Teilhard de Chardin. In 1980, Harvard professor Stephen Jay Gould would publish his belief that Teilhard himself was a co-conspirator with Dawson, who helped him create the Piltdown hoax. Yet another Jesuit trained priest named George Lemaitre would further these ideas and develop the Big Bang Theory in 1931. It might be said that no doctrine has been more devastating to faith in the Bible than Darwin's theory of evolution. But was it only coincidence that Charles Darwin himself published Origin of the Species in 1859, the same year that Tischendorf discovered Codex Sinaiticus. Just as La Pereira's theory about men before Adam worked together with Richard Simon's historic criticism 
So Darwin's theory of evolution would work alongside Codex Sinaiticus to destroy the faith of countless millions in the scripture as the inspired and inerrant word of God. It's important to consider that from the period of 1828 to 1912, it can be shown that the Vatican and her Jesuit priests were involved in fakery and forgery. This is significant because this time frame includes the same period that Tischendorf was working with Rome. After Tischendorf revealed his Codex Sinaiticus, he was hailed as a great scholar and greeted with laudation across Europe. Oh, cheers, <laughs> my good friend. But shortly after the work was published, it was challenged by a prominent expert in paleography. His name was Constantine Simonides. Constantine Simonides is undoubtedly the forgotten link in the history of Codex Sinaiticus. And it's because he waged uh, an open and a public debate against Tischendorf for about four years, arguing that Codex Sinaiticus was not an ancient manuscript. And the more you study Simonides, you realize that he was a very important figure at that time. Alexander von Humboldt declared that Simonides was an enigma. Others believed his understanding of ancient languages to be ingenious. A 19th century publication said of him, Dr. Simonides is a Greek by birth, and he speaks and writes the classic language of his forefathers with fluency, purity, and elegance. From his uncle, Simonides thoroughly acquired the art of paleography and became so great a proficient therein that few surpass him either in the practice of it or in the diagnosis of manuscripts. Simonides had quite a reputation in the 19th century. On the one hand, he was a respected paleographer, but on the other hand, he had kind of a cloak and dagger history and was looked upon as sort of a Greek Indiana Jones, involved not only with ancient manuscripts, but also fighting battles as a Greek patriot against the Ottoman Turkish Empire, which is an important part of understanding who he was. Come, my brothers, we shall avenge the blood of our fathers on this Turkish invader. Let us be strong in our weakness, and with God's help we shall prevail. One of the newspapers of the time reported that the escapades of Mr. Simonides extend over nearly 20 years. In Alexandria, he contrived to quarrel with some Arabs, pistoled two of them, received some ugly wounds on the head and face from a third. In Macedonia, his native country, he succeeded in getting up a little insurrection among his countrymen who joined him in the leadership of the Patriot bands. He fell on a detachment of Turkish soldiers, drove them into a river, and destroyed some 150 of them. These are the kinds of stories recorded about Simonides as a Greek Patriot, who was still fighting against the Turks in a conflict that dated all the way back to the fall of Constantinople in 1453 when the Turks invaded the ancient capital of the Greek Orthodox Empire. In the 19th century, the Greeks remembered Constantinople as if it had just happened the day before. 
Simonides was apparently involved in continued battles with the Turks and controversies against the Latinizers, or Roman Catholics as he called them, because both the Turks and the Catholic Church had fought against the Greek Orthodox Kingdom. And so for Simonides, the Turks and the Catholics were both ancient enemies. And this conflict with Rome in particular would have everything to do with his controversy against Tischendorf. And then as a scholar, Simonides was equally in the thick of debates about ancient manuscripts. He had presented his work before kings, nobles, foreign ministers, diplomats. He'd sold a number of manuscripts to the British Museum and other prominent institutions in Europe. So he was involved in the highest levels of the academic world at that time. Simonides owned a collection of more than 5,000 ancient manuscripts that he had partly inherited from his uncle. As he traveled across Europe, he presented these works at libraries and universities. Their content often sparked intense debate. Simonides' debates usually centered around the understanding of ancient languages, and he generally believed that his own knowledge was superior to those around him, although he did not have a reputation for arrogance. But while he was in Germany, he got into a vicious conflict with the scholars at the University of Leipzig, and it was there in 1855 that he made enemies with von Tischendorf. So now, years later, when he comes forward and questions Codex Sinaiticus, he does so as Tischendorf's old nemesis. Simonides claimed that Codex Sinaiticus was no ancient manuscript at all, but a modern work created by himself and two other Greeks in 1840. <laughs> while Tischendorf was in the midst of enjoying his fame. The story of Simonides began to be published in the London newspapers. Simonides! Needless to say, Tischendorf was furious. Schweinholz! Idiot! What followed would be a public debate that would continue in a variety of London newspapers for the next two years. In July of 1861, a publication called the Literary Gazette reported that, we understand that in literary circles, a rumor prevails that the manuscript now publishing by the Russian government under the direction of Mr. Tischendorf, purporting to be a manuscript Bible of the fourth century, is not an ancient manuscript, but is an entirely modern production written by a gentleman now alive, who will shortly take measures to establish his claim to the authorship. The manuscript is known as the Codex Sinaiticus and has attracted a large amount of attention throughout Europe. Should the rumor prove to be correct, as we believe it will, the disclosures that will follow must be of the greatest interest to archaeology. In his letter, Simonides says that the controversy began over Codex Sinaiticus when he first saw the manuscript in Liverpool in 1860. And then it was the following year that the newspapers got hold of the story. So this story first appears in 1861, but Simonides did not publish his side of the story until 1862. And the only reason he did so is because he was drawn in uh, to the conflict by two of the prominent scholars at that time. The two scholars in question were Samuel P. Tregellis and Fenton John Anthony Hort. Tregellis and Hort believed Sinaiticus to be real and took sides against Simonides almost immediately. Tregellis wrote that the story of Simonides was as false and absurd as possible. In response, Simonides defended his argument 
as published in the Guardian newspaper in September of 1862, where he said, When about two years ago, I saw the first facsimiles of Tischendorf, which were put into my hand at Liverpool by Mr. Newton, a friend of Dr. Tregellis, I at once recognized my own work, as I immediately told him. In the book, Codex Sinaiticus and the Simonides Affair, author J.K. Eliot confirms that Simonides spoke of his authorship to a man named J.E. Hodgkin in 1860 and in a letter to Sir Thomas Phillips on August 2, 1861. Simonides claimed that the manuscript had not been created with any intention to deceive, but was intended by himself and his uncle as a gift to Tsar Nicholas I of Russia. To prove his claims, Simonides challenged Tischendorf to a public debate. Yet Tischendorf refused to take part. About this, Simonides wrote, the real test of the genuineness of the Codex Sinaiticus is neglected. The public were assured that in May, Tischendorf was to be in London, armed with a portion at least of his great Codex. I have waited in England, hoping to have the opportunity of meeting him face to face to prove him in error. But May has come and gone and the discoverer has not appeared. Let the favorers of the antiquity of the manuscript persuade him to come at once and brave the ordeal, or else forever hold his peace. Yet despite the evasiveness of Tischendorf, most of the newspapers in England defended him and denounced Simonides as a fraud. The attacks were almost fanatical and often unreasonable. Could Tischendorf's relationship with Rome have had something to do with it? During this same era, Protestant historian J. A. Wiley wrote about the Jesuits' influence in English media. In his book on the Jesuits' morals, maxims, and plots, he said that there are two institutions in especial to which the Jesuits will lay siege. These are the press and the pulpit. The press of Great Britain is already manipulated by them to an extent of which the public but little dream. The whole English press of the world is supervised and the word is passed round how writers, speakers, and causes are to be handled, and applause or condemnation dealt out just as it may accord with the interests and wishes of Rome. Yet Simonides was not without his supporters. Another paper, called The Literary Churchman, questioned the antiquity of Codex Sinaiticus and argued that Simonides should be heard. They said, For ourselves, we must profess entire impartiality. Though we were quite ready, from the first, to admit the importance of the discovery of Tischendorf, we are not prepared at this moment to say with Dr. Tregellis that the statements of Simonides are as false and absurd as possible. Tischendorf applies these terms false and absurd, just now, to Tregellus himself. The reason Tischendorf attacked Tregellus was because he disagreed with him about the writing of Codex Sinaiticus. Tregellus said, On one point, I believe that I differ materially from Tischendorf as to the writing of the manuscript. He thinks that he sees traces of various hands having been employed in such a way that a change of writer must have frequently taken place. I believe that the difference is to be attributed to the scribe having more or less ink in his style, the ink being more or less thick and the surface of the vellum slightly varying. In other words, the scribe dips his stylus into an inkwell 
and when he first begins to write, there's a lot of ink on it. But sooner or later, the ink runs thin. In places where the ink ran thin, Tischendorf believed that this signified a change of writers, and hence the passage of time. Tregellus, on the other hand, believed that it was the same scribe, it's just that he sometimes ran low on ink. That was the difference. But when you factor in that Tischendorf spreads his scribes and correctors from the 4th century all the way to the 7th century, a span of some 300 years, you're left wondering just how precise the scientific methods were that they employed. Also consider that similar contentions are made about ancient bones that are dug up out of the ground where the scientists tell us that these are millions of years old and so forth. Do they really have the ability to date bones that way? And did Tischendorf really have the ability to date ancient manuscripts? After the initial attacks against him began, Simonides asserted that these scholars, in reality, knew little or nothing about ancient manuscripts. In response to one of his critics, he wrote, Neither you nor Tischendorf possess the true knowledge of paleographical science. You have only learned to say at random, This is genuine and this is spurious, but you do not know the reason. This comment might be brushed aside, but for the often repeated testimony that Simonides exceeded his contemporaries in the expertise of manuscript evidence. James Farrar, in his 1907 book on literary forgeries, wrote that Tischendorf was only the senior of Simonides by five years, and in the science of paleography had neither his knowledge nor his experience. Another scholar whose testimony was chiefly regarded was Henry Bradshaw, keeper of manuscripts at the Cambridge University Library. Bradshaw sided with Tischendorf, and once this was known, he was confronted in person by Simonides. In a letter describing the encounter, Bradshaw wrote, Dr. Simonides wrote to me to convince me and my friends that it was quite possible for him to have written the volume in question. He had invited some of us to Christ College to discuss matters fairly. He could speak and understand English pretty well, but his friend was with him to interpret and explain. They really seemed to believe that all people in the West were as ignorant of Greek as the Greeks are of Latin. But the great question was, how do you satisfy yourselves of the genuineness of any manuscript? I first replied that it was really difficult to define, that it seemed to be more a kind of instinct than anything else. Dr. Simonides and his friend readily caught at this as too much like vague assertion, and they naturally ridiculed any such idea. But I further said that I had lived for six years past in the constant, almost daily habit of examining manuscripts. Bradshaw then applied this principle to his opinion of Codex Sinaiticus. When Simonides objected, Bradshaw said, I told him, as politely as I could, that I was not to be convinced against the evidence of my senses. So Bradshaw essentially admitted that there was no real scientific proof as to the age of Codex Sinaiticus and he ultimately admitted that all he trusted in were his senses or his instincts about the manuscript. And Bradshaw is very significant because it was his reputation as a scholar that really compelled people to embrace Tischendorf's Codex. Bradshaw further said that Dr. Simonides always maintained that the Mount Athos Bible, meaning Codex Sinaiticus, written in 1840 for the Emperor of Russia, was not meant to deceive anyone, that it was Professor Tischendorf's ignorance and inexperience which rendered him so easily deceived 
where no deception was intended. Mount Athos was the location where Simonides claimed he had created the Codex. He provided many details for how the manuscript had been written and how it came to be at Mount Sinai. He also provided many names of those in the Greek world who he said could confirm that he created the manuscript. But strangely, most of these details were never investigated, either by the supporters of Tischendorf or by the newspapers of the time. In 1907, James Farrar wrote that the controversy cannot be said to have been settled by the mere opinions of Tregellus or Bradshaw, who examined the Codex two months before Simonides had made his claim to it as his work, so that they had no reason to examine it with suspicion. But could there have been some other motive that drove the critical scholars at this time? Simonides was a real threat to the academic establishment of Western Europe. If what he claimed was true, it would have shown that Tregellus, Bradshaw, Hort, and Tischendorf knew little or nothing about dating ancient texts. So you can imagine how hard they fought to discredit him. Uh, not only that, but Simonides was working at the time with a man named Joseph Mayer, who was the founder of the Mayer Museum in Liverpool. And while there, uh, Mr. Mayer had him come and examine a series of ancient Egyptian scrolls that he had purchased years before. So Mr. Mayer brings Simonides to the museum and what he uncovered were first century fragments and parchments that shattered some of the claims that were being made by the higher critics. He found a first century fragment of the Gospel of Matthew that was dated within 15 years of the ascension of Christ. And this proved that Matthew was the first gospel, not Mark, and that it was originally written in Greek, not in Hebrew or Aramaic, as the critics had speculated. Uh, also, he displayed a first century scroll that contained 1 John 5, 7, the Johannine comma, which is a hotly disputed verse among higher critics. And this proved that they were wrong and that the verse was not invented in later centuries as they had been saying. And this was on display at Cambridge University and then at the Royal Society in London. And if you read the accounts, these things were so controversial that some later historians tried to claim that Simonides had sold uh, this scroll of the Gospel of Matthew to Mr. Mayer as some kind of forgery or something. But if you read the newspaper accounts, it's very clear uh, Mr. Mayer acknowledged that in fact he had purchased the scroll years before he ever uh, met Constantine Simonides. So uh, there was a lot of propaganda and false accusation that came against Simonides because these discoveries were so threatening to what the critics wanted to believe. In December of 1862, the London Review wrote that the few believers in Simonides represented him as a man whose towering genius had aroused the envy alike of Grecian professors, German students, and English librarians, and banded them together in a conspiracy to crush him. In December of 1862, a publication called the Brighton Observer reported that Professor Tischendorf, having visited the Holy Land, returned to Europe with a voluminous manuscript that he obtained from the library of the monastery of Mount Sinai, the earliest known copy of the Bible. <laughs> 
In time, one of the parts fell into the hands of Simonides, who at once recognized it as a manuscript he had himself executed. He made his assertion public that the Codex Sinaiticus had been written by himself. But Tischendorf and the learned men of Germany refused to recognize the claims of Simonides and continued its publication. Things went on this way, some persons believing Simonides, some Tischendorf. When suddenly a Greek Archimandrite wrote to the English papers from Alexandria, corroborating the statement of Simonides and stating that he remembered seeing Simonides engaged in writing out the copy of the Bible in question in the ancient Greek characters on Mount Athos. The Greek monk mentioned in the article was a friend of Simonides whose name was Kalinikos. Kalinikos wrote a series of letters to the English newspapers confirming the story of Simonides and denouncing Tischendorf, whom he called the master and pupil of all guile and all wickedness. In one of his letters, published in the Literary Churchman, Kalinikos wrote, I repeat that the manuscript in dispute is the work of the unwearied Simonides and of no other person. A portion of this was secretly removed from Mount Sinai by Professor Tischendorf in 1844. The rest, with inconceivable recklessness, he mutilated and tampered with, according to his liking, in the year 1859. Some leaves he destroyed, especially such as contained the acrostics of Simonides. What's interesting is Kalinikos's mention of how Tischendorf destroyed uh, the pages that had the markings of Simonides on them, which may explain why some of the pages were burned. It's important to remember that to this day, the monks at Mount Sinai deny Tischendorf's story and his claim that he found the manuscript in a rubbish basket. So where would the burned pages of the manuscript have come from? Is it possible that Tischendorf burned parts of them to destroy the markings of Simonides, as Kalinikos suggests? And this might explain why he came up with a story about the monks throwing the pages into the fire later on a story which nobody really seems to believe. Kalinikos claimed that he himself had been at St. Catherine's Monastery when Tischendorf was there, and that Tischendorf took the first pages of the manuscript without permission. He said, I further declare that the codex which Dr. Tischendorf obtained is the identical codex which Simonides wrote, inasmuch as I saw it in the hands of Tischendorf and recognized the work. Kalinikos also claimed that the manuscript had been washed with lemon juice and herbs to weaken the appearance of the letters and to give it a more ancient look. In response to these accusations, the supporters of Tischendorf insisted that Simonides had forged the letters himself, and they claimed that Kalinikos was a fictional character. Yet in his book, James Farrar tells us that Kalinikos was indeed a real person, and that his letters cannot be brushed aside as the testimony of a fabulous being. Yet the letters of Kalinikos bear within them an almost prophetic warning about the Codex. He wrote to the newspapers in 1862 that, you will greatly sin in foisting on the world a new manuscript as an old one, and especially a manuscript containing the Holy Scriptures. Injury to the church must accrue from all this, even from the evidently numerous corrections of the manuscript. Tischendorf originally documented some 14,000 
800 corrections. Today, the Codex Sinaiticus has its home at the British Library in London. In 2009, they finished the Codex Sinaiticus project, which was aimed at fully examining Tischendorf's famous manuscript. In 2008, we interviewed Dr. Juan Garces, one of the curators of the project, while the work was still in progress. Part of the Codex Sinaiticus project is to gather all the material, commission top scholars to go through that material and uh, write reports, sit around a table and discuss it and publish it all. Uh, first of all, the documents, but also the, the, um, uh, the history, the agreed historical account of how it came from St. Catherine's Monastery. I think the great um, role of this project is to produce this history, which hasn't been written, uh, as, as we all agree, uh, well enough. So uh, I hope in 2009, July, we will be able to tell the full story. Is it true, is there any truth to the assertion that von Tischendorf found the, uh, the first manuscript in a, in a trash barrel? He said in, in his book that he found it in a basket, but again, I mean, this is one of the many voices that make the whole of the history. And um, I'm in no position to, to confirm that as, as being probable or, or not. While we were suspicious of this answer when we heard it, we chose to wait until they finished their research before jumping to a conclusion. Yet, incredibly, once the British Library published their website, we found that they omitted most all of the documented history about Codex Sinaiticus. They ignored Tischendorf's own testimony about finding the manuscript in a rubbish basket. Instead, they claimed that the monks brought it to his attention in 1844. And while they said they were going to tell the full story, their website makes no mention of the four-year controversy with Constantine Simonides. We also spoke with Dr. Scott McKendrick, the head of Western Manuscripts, about the comparison between Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus. Uh, they're different also in quite one, one critical way in that Sinaiticus, or two ways actually I'd say, two ways. One is that uh, Vaticanus does not have the, the extent of correction. That's a very critical difference. Sinaiticus is the, the most corrected manuscript of a Greek manuscript of the, the scriptures. The second is that uh, Vaticanus has a very, now has a very strange appearance. When you look at it as a sort of manuscript expert, although you know that people tell you that it's a, it's a fourth century manuscript, it actually looks like a 15th century manuscript. And there's one very simple reason for that is that almost the entire text has been overwritten by a 15th century scribe. Not only that, he's added in 15th century decoration, titling and so forth. So it has a very strange appearance. Is it possible that the reason Codex Vaticanus has a strange and even newer appearance is that it may not be a truly ancient manuscript? The earliest recorded date for Vaticanus is 1475 AD, when it was first entered into the record of the Vatican Library. The manuscript had formerly been rejected by Erasmus and the reformers because they believed it was corrupt. Yet somehow, the warnings of the Reformation were completely ignored by Tischendorf and the scholars who supported him. They all embraced Vaticanus without questioning its authenticity or considering that it may have been one of Rome's many historic forgeries. Among this company of scholars was F.H.A. Scrivener, another prominent academic who also opposed Constantine Simonides.
The strange thing about all of these guys, Bradshaw, Scrivener, Tregellis, Hort, all of them who supported Codex Vaticanus uh, and who questioned Constantine Simonides, it's understandable that they would question Simonides because he had been accused of forgery. That makes sense, that they would take the time to investigate his claims. But why they did not apply the same standard to the Vatican when the Vatican has a much longer and much more provable history of forgery and fakery and fraud, why they didn't apply the same standard when they were examining Codex Vaticanus just doesn't make any sense. And in fact, if you study what happened when Tregellis, for example, when he goes to the Vatican Library to examine Codex Vaticanus, uh, the priest there behaved in a very strange manner. And he said, while he was looking at the Codex, there were priests in the room, and they were making noise and so on to try and distract him. And he said that if he spent too much time looking at any one page for too long and studying it, they would come and snatch it away, almost as though they didn't want him to have an opportunity to study it too closely. Among the more startling features of Vaticanus are its many omissions. Uh, in the Gospels alone, it leaves out 237 words, 452 clauses, and 748 whole sentences. Uh, and uh, other manuscripts agree that those things are there. While Vaticanus is known for its omissions, Sinaiticus is famous for its more than 14,000 corrections, many more than the average biblical codex. While Tischendorf reported some 14,800 corrections, once the British Library's project was complete, the number was inflated dramatically. They are notice the conclusion that the BBC is giving. They're saying that if this oldest Bible, supposedly, had all of these mistakes and variants in it, well, then that proves it cannot be the immutable, inerrant Word of God, hence confirming what the Jesuits and the Vatican and all the Catholic scholars and the higher critics had been arguing for hundreds of years in their attempts to destroy the Protestant doctrine of sola scriptura. This same BBC documentary even goes on to show how the influence of Codex Sinaiticus would specifically undermine the Protestant faith in the King James Bible. First dis uh, discovered in 1844, uh, this met exactly what Tischendorf was looking for. In other words, a very early manuscript of the Christian Bible, and in particular, of course, what he'd he subsequently found was the earliest complete New Testament. But is Codex Sinaiticus really the earliest copy of the New Testament? Or is it a 19th century work created by Constantine Simonides? A work that was somehow tampered with and manipulated to fulfill a centuries old agenda. After presenting many names, dates, and places to the scholars of Western Europe, Simonides himself seemed to grow weary of the debates. At one point he wrote, What then have you to oppose to the evidence of living men, O zealous defender of the pseudo sanatic Codex? If you are still incredulous, I say to you, remain faithful in your faithlessness. I have proclaimed the truth, for I will answer as I should to the all-seeing God in the day of judgment. Therefore, I have spoken. I have no sin. Holy yours, Constantine Simonides. Simonides would publish a final work in 1864 before leaving England for good. In it, he reaffirmed his claims about Sinaiticus and included the testimonies of those who believed him. Yet his enemies in the press continued to insist that he was merely a liar and a forger.
The charge of forgery was never proven against Simonides, but can be traced to his initial conflict with Tischendorf at the University of Leipzig in 1855. When Simonides presented the first known copy of the Shepherd of Hermas in Greek. The reason the Shepherd of Hermas is important is because it's a work that was embraced by the early church. But in Western Europe, it was only known in Latin, and yet scholars knew that it had originally been written in Greek, but nobody had ever found a copy in Greek. Constantine Simonides was the first man to bring a Greek copy of the Shepherd of Hermas into Western Europe. And that's very important because the Shepherd of Hermas is also found as part of Codex Sinaiticus. And this supports the idea that he could have created Codex Sinaiticus. Why? Because he had access to a Greek copy of the Shepherd of Hermas. And he's the only person in the world who had a copy uh, of the Greek version of the Shepherd of Hermas. That's why it's so significant. While most of the scholars at Leipzig embraced the Hermas manuscript as genuine, Tischendorf declared it to be a forgery because it disagreed with the Latin version. In response, Simonides argued that the manuscript Hermas was correct and that the common Latin translations from which it differed had been made, not in accordance with the Greek originals, but to suit the views of the Latin translators who had put into the mouth of Hermas doctrinal opinions eminently calculated to strengthen the position of the Catholic Church to which the translators belonged. Simonides' biographer wrote that, as some of the chief dogmas of the Latin Church were severely attacked by an exposure of the fraud in the Latin translations, Simonides gained much ill will among the members of that church. This cannot be right. This is a forgery. The charge of forgery would be exaggerated in the English press to the point that Simonides would eventually be accused of forging nearly everything he came in contact with. He is said to have left England about 1864. But then, in 1870, a number of the men who opposed him would become involved in the new revision committee for the King James Bible. The committee was led by Fenton John Anthony Hort, the friend of Tregellus, who was among the first to embrace the Codex Sinaiticus. Under his leadership, the committee would create a new Greek text in fulfillment of what Tischendorf had written in 1866. They used as their foundation Codex Vaticanus and the Codex Sinaiticus. It was an entirely new Greek text that is different to anything that, was, that existed before. Hort seems to have been motivated by a hatred for the traditional Greek of the Reformation. He referred to it as villainous and as that vile Textus Receptus. His partner was an Anglican bishop named B.F. Westcott. Other committee members included Tregellus along with F.H.A. Scrivener. It is interesting to note that the committee also invited John Henry Newman, who was at the time a Catholic priest. And while he declined the offer, their invitation reveals much about the theological opinions of Westcott and Hort. You know, there's definite links to Roman Catholicism there in the different Bibles, you know, Westcott and Hort, there were uh, definitely Anglo-Catholics at best. So you would call Westcott and Hort Anglo-Catholics? Yeah, I would think that you would have to class them as that. You have your whole Tractarian movement going on at that time in, in the Anglican Church, and that was the Anglo-Catholic movement 
uh, by John Henry Newman, who later became a cardinal in the uh, Roman Catholic Church, but he was in the Anglican Church at that time, and John Keeble and Stroud and many of the other writers, they were all working to make Anglicanism Roman, Roman Catholic. They wanted to introduce many Roman Catholic practices into Anglican, and a, about 200 Anglicans converted to Roman Catholicism at that time and thousands of members. So now there are about 1,000 Anglican ministers ready to convert to Rome in the year of our Lord, 2011. So the whole Anglo-Catholic movement has been going on in England. And out of that, then Westcott and Hort, they really were in the midst of all that furor about uh, introducing uh, Ang uh, Roman Catholic ideas into the Anglican Church. Westcott and Hort, in their letters, they're very pro-Catholic. At one point, Westcott described seeing a Pieta statue of the Catholic Mary holding the dead body of Jesus. He wrote, had I been alone, I could have knelt there for hours. And Hort said that there's no, no difference between Jesus worship and Mary worship in its, in it, in its causes and its effects. And so uh, there's a very strong Catholic thing there, as there was with the American committee, with uh, Philip Schaff. He was very supportive of the Catholicism. Philip Schaff would lead the committee that would develop the American Standard Version of the Bible in 1901, based on the same Greek text created by Westcott and Hort. Like Tischendorf, Schaff met privately with Pope Gregory XVI and even admitted to kissing his red slipper. Schaff would become known as the ecumenical prophet who claimed he was promoting the germs of a new theology. And we know where he was heading with all of that because he was the, one of the founders of the World Parliament of Religion that had their first meeting in 1893. And uh, the speakers at that were from all sorts of religions. They were from, um, from Buddhist, Bud Buddhism, uh, Hinduism. These were all the speakers that spoke. Uh, Shintoism, the Bishop of Japan spoke on Shintoism. And the subjects that they covered was quite amazing. And so there was a, a mixture on Islam. Um, there was a Muslim speaker um, and Christian science and uh, New Age. Uh, Annie Passant was the opening speaker who was a co-author of the magazine called Lucifer, which was a part of the Theosophy Society's publication. And so uh, there was a real strong roots and connection there. During these events, the Lord's Prayer was retitled the Universal Prayer. Their motto was, Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? If you read the historic account of the Parliament, there's no question that there was a very strong focus on Christianity and the Bible. But the idea was that Christ was inclusive. And so rather than calling for all those who worshiped idols to repent, as Paul did when he witnessed to the Athenians, the parliament determined that all the pagan religions should be embraced and intermingled with Christianity. Strangely, the subject of Philip Schaff's speech was the reunion of Christendom. In it, he said, there is a unity of Christian scholarship of all creeds. This unity has been strikingly illustrated in the Anglo-American revision of the authorized version of the scriptures. Was Schaff somehow suggesting that the revision committee of 1870 was part of a greater agenda? It is worth considering that when Westcott and Hort finished their revision of the King James Bible, their new Greek text was openly condemned by Dean John Bergen, who published a critique titled, The Revision Revised. In it, he said, I frankly confess that to me, 
All this looks very much indeed like what, in the language of lawyers, is called conspiracy. Do you believe that the Jesuits' counter-reformation is going on still today? Oh yeah. I believe that uh, that's one of the main efforts of the Church of Rome to undo the work of the Protestant Reformation. And I think the Jesuits, they have been in the forefront uh, of the battle, and they were so evil that the popes finally disbanded them. The first pope that was going to do that was poisoned, and the second pope, uh, that's, he said that they would probably get him too, and he was also after he signed the bill to suppress the order, he suffered a long time in agony from the poison that he got. But then they were reintroduced again uh, by the church, and so they're still working today. They have changed their tactics, I believe, to, to work in the ecumenical movement. In the 20th century, the Vatican would take the concept of ecumenical unity to a global level through Vatican Council II, which redefined the position of Rome on all the religions of the world. But exactly what role would the revision of the Bible play in this new movement. At the World Parliament in 1893, Philip Schaff said, Christ promised us one flock under one shepherd, but not one fold. The famous passage, John 10:16, has been mistranslated, and the error has passed into the King James's version. Christ's flock is one, but there are many folds. We must look, therefore, to a much broader union. In the scripture, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. While the Apostle Peter declared, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Meanwhile, the Apostle Paul warned the church when he said, If any man preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. Yet if men could believe that the earliest New Testament manuscripts were full of errors and that early Christians were unsure of what to believe, then it could be possible that such bold verses in the scripture are not so decisive after all. And hence, the door to many religions could thus be opened. Is this, perhaps, what Rome desired all along? Many examples might be given for the influence of Rome in modern times. But among the more interesting is an interview with Leo Hindry, the managing partner of Intermedia Partners. His company took possession of the largest Christian publishing house in the world. Thomas Nelson Publishers. In this interview, Hendry was asked about what drove him to be successful. What gave you the ambition to go from, you know, sort of blue collar jobs to wanting to become, uh, I guess, a business? Yeah. Um, yeah, lots of, of demons, lots of devils that have always caused me to want to succeed. I, I was blessed with some, some intellect that uh, some intellectual curiosity as well that just drove me. I had uh, 
uh, a lot of my early influences came from the Jesuits. I was uh, Jesuit trained at both the high school level and the college, and I, I always knew that, that I wanted to be something special. I don't mean that self-servingly, but I, I did want to succeed and, and, and be well thought of, and I, I give a lot of the early, early credit to the Jesuits. In 2011, Intermedia Partners sold possession of Thomas Nelson to Rupert Murdoch, most famous for his ownership of Fox News. Murdoch is also a knight of the Pontifical Order of St. Gregory, knighted by the Pope for his service to Rome. Through Thomas Nelson, Murdoch's company now publishes the new King James Bible. And through Zondervan, he publishes the NIV Bible as well. Interestingly, Mr. Murdoch also owns Harper Collins that publishes the Satanic Bible for the Church of Satan. But are these things just strange coincidences or could there be other powers at work? We consider this interview with the late Malachi Martin a former Jesuit priest and author of a best-selling book on the history of the Jesuit order. In this interview, Martin reveals what are said to be the dark powers at work in Rome. Father, uh, I've got an article here entitled, Two Eminent Churchmen Agree. Yes. Uh, that there actually is, this is a shocker to a lot of people, yeah. uh, that there is, there are satanic practices going on at the Vatican. Could that be true? Yeah. Now, when we say in the Vatican, it's at a certain level. And um, there's no doubt about it that there have been and still are practices that are uh, formally uh, venerating Lucifer, the prince of this world. In the scripture, the destruction of spiritual Babylon is clearly foretold. We read that Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus told the parable of a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, an enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. The tare is said to be a type of weed known as the darnel. The darnel is sometimes called false wheat because as it grows, it appears almost exactly like the real wheat surrounding it. But as it nears the harvest, the wheat turns golden brown, but the darnel turns black, and its seeds are full of poison. Jesus said, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. With these things in mind, we ask the question, when it comes to the history of the church and the Bible, who are the tares and who are the wheat? And through which of them has been preserved the true and faithful record of the Word of God? <laughs> 